uh, while it's going here, and we'll just share a little bit of the experience of STS-109 with you. Of course, uh, this is our patch. One of the first things a crew does when they get together is uh, decide what your patch is supposed to look like. I'm glad it had my name on it. That's my favorite part. <laughs> Here we all are uh, in the suit-up room about four hours prior to launch. Everybody's getting dressed, uh, making the final checks of our equipment before we head out to the pad. And uh, there's Jim Newman, our uh, missing crew member, making his fourth flight. And Mike, uh, you can tell the, the New York wave there. You know, <laughs> here we are uh, strapping in. It's amazing how different it is sometimes as you're uh, climbing into the vehicle that's in the vertical. It's sort of like jumping into your car. If it was tilted, parked straight up in the garage, you can see I am a little bit larger than some astronauts, and it's uh, a struggle at times, but I'm glad I, I had the seat. That's Mike getting his place. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, main engine start, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, you get about seven and you get about seven million pounds of thrust hit you from behind uh, all at once there. So we knew we were going up to get Hubble 360 miles high. Quite a bit of vibration in the cockpit when the solids light, and that lasts for about uh, the first two minutes of the flight. Real nice light show, and uh, the folks on the ground told us that that uh, we did a real nice job of lighting up this uh, beautiful cloud deck that was overhead the launch pad. Kind of an artificial sun going there, and an early sunrise for the folks watching, watching the launch. And there we are on track to go uh, catch Hubble and give it an upgrade. Two minutes after liftoff, the solids come off and the ride smooths out considerably, as you can see from this uh, next view inside the cockpit. And uh, we're finally getting high enough to get into the sun. About eight, eight and a half minutes after liftoff, we're in space. The engine's cut off. Uh, three, you go from three Gs to zero Gs all of a sudden, and things start to float if they're not tied down. Rick got a real nice shot of the external tank as it, after it came off and uh, floats over the coast of Africa. As soon as we got to orbit, it was time to uh, check out all the systems, checking out the suits and the arms on flight day two. And then on flight day three, it was ready for the rendezvous. And uh, Scooter did a fantastic job getting Hubble nice and stable in the payload bay for me to reach over and grapple with the arm. Grappling a free flyer is always a very exciting time. Um, I'm very fortunate that they only take a, a matter of minutes because I'm not sure I can take that much stress for that much longer at periods of my uh, in periods of my life. Uh, this was Hubble as we approached it. Absolutely spectacular. We saw it um, quite a ways away. It looked like a, a bright star on the horizon as we approached. Uh, 400 feet, I came to the back cockpit at the arm station, helped Scooter with the uh, television cameras, and then he got it nice and stable to maneuver over with the end of the robotic arm and grapple it. And uh, we knew that we had five days of planned EVAs, and the first thing we had to do is grapple Hubble, or we didn't have any EVAs. So we, there were about six crew members looking at me, making sure that uh, this all occurred uh, according to plan. Uh, they would have been very upset with me uh, had we missed it. Uh, once we had it in the bay, then the very first thing we did was go ahead and roll up the solar arrays. The uh, solar rays are the ESA rays that we put up in 1993, and on that first servicing mission, we had to toss one overboard because it didn't retract all the way. So we had uh, a pool on board Columbia going as to whether we'd get them both rolled up, and it was pretty dicey all the way up until the end. We saw some interesting dynamics there, but we were lucky, uh, fortunate this time that they both rolled up, and that set the stage for the first of our five EVAs. On days one and two, our job was to replace those ESA solar rays with U.S.-made gallium arsenide arrays that would provide more power to the Hubble Space Telescope. We also had a unique capability on board this time, which was the helmet cams. I sometimes call it the monkey cam, because it gives you the view uh, as if you're riding sort of on our shoulder of what we were doing. And this is uh, one of us putting the solar array up against the telescope so we could remove it and then bring it down under the careful uh, flying of Nancy on the robotic arm into the payload bay and install it on a special carrier to bring back. I think these arrays are probably going to head back to ESA, but I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see them, uh, at least one of them, up in the Smithsonian at some time in the future. We had a lot of important tools on board. We had hundreds of tools, in fact. And in, in my right hand, there is a, a special 
screwdriver, power screwdriver, and that was one of our best friends on this mission. Uh, and it's just like the ones you might get at a hardware store, but I don't think you'll find that particular one at Home Depot. After we got the uh, old solar arrays uh, uh, latched onto the, uh, onto the carrier, we took out the new arrays. And uh, Nancy flew, uh, flew us up. Uh, Rick and I did this job. Rick on the first DVA, I did on the second. Nancy flew us up and away from the carrier. And we had to rotate these arrays to get the mast pointed toward the telescope. We were not uh, tethered to these away, arrays. They weigh a little over 600 pounds. So when we did the rotation, we wanted to go very, very slowly. And this is a picture from uh, one of our helmet cameras of what that rotation was like. Uh, we wanted to uh, make sure we never let go of it. Uh, because if we did, people would be very disappointed, and uh, we probably wouldn't have such a good film to show you. <laughs> but uh, we had to do it very delicately so we didn't put any unwanted motion into the, into the array. And that's uh, a picture of uh, the array after we've rotated it and got it pointed toward the telescope. And unlike the other arrays that you saw that uh, rolled up, these unfolded. You can see these are being unfolded now, kind of like a book opening up. And these are the last few degrees of the, the uh, opening of the, uh, of the new solar array. And it gives Hubble a much different look than, the, uh, than it uh, had earlier. You can see the model we have up at front has the longer arrays. And now the picture you can see in the, uh, in the film shows uh, much smaller arrays. There's Digger in his uh, photo TV uh, nest there. He was kind of like a producer, director, Steven Spielberg uh, combined uh, uh, with a lot of jobs of keeping, uh, keeping all the film work and all these uh, videos uh, in line. Uh, Jim and I, on, our second, uh, on the second spacewalk, our first, uh, we also changed out a reaction wheel to help uh, the, the telescope point. We got the word a few months before we launched that one of those failed, and we, this got added to our mission a few months before we, uh, before we launched. And uh, here's some more of the helmet camera views that John was talking about at the, uh, uh, at the end of, uh, of our EVAs, of the second EVA. Just a view of uh, the orbiter prior to the third EVA. The morning of the third EVA, we woke up, got into our spacesuits, ready to go out the door, and with about 20 minutes to go, uh, we discovered that one of the water valves on, on my backpack had sprung a leak. And so suddenly we were in the situation of wondering how the day was going to go. This was our most challenging day. It was the power control unit one, the one for which uh, Rick's in my left hand would, would play a, such an important role. But we overcame that, resized the suit, and then was the scary part. For the first time, we unplugged the telescope. So it was totally unpowered for the first time in 12 years. You don't usually do that to a satellite in orbit. And then Rick and I started uh, disconnecting the connectors with a in track of all those 36 connectors. We uh, changed out the old for new. Uh, there's about a thousand small gold pins there on the side of those connectors. With uh, Nancy carefully guiding me back to the telescope, we put the power control unit in and methodically, one by one, started putting the connectors back on. Uh, while we were doing these activities, it really became crucial to think about the zen of putting connectors on. You had to think about one connector at a time. If you thought about the whole thing, uh, it would have been impossible. For, uh, for EVA 3, I mean EVA 4, we finally got to the part that we all really were excited about, and that was putting some science on the telescope. Everything prior to that was really getting the systems of Hubble ready so that it could support you know, as much additional mission lifetime as we can put into the Hubble Space Telescope. And so here is the, uh, the team of Mike and Jim taking the faint object camera out. And this is kind of exciting because this is the last of the scientific instruments that was there from the beginning, from the original launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so we put that out over the, the left wing of Columbia and brought out the advanced camera for surveys. This is an incredible new digital camera. It actually has three cameras in it. And this is the tool that will allow us to have 10 times the discovery potential of the older Hubble now that that advanced camera for surveys is installed. We had a really uh, good experience putting it into the telescope. Mike hooked up the connectors. And then we had the chance to put the faint object camera back into its stowage location in Columbia's payload bay. And this is a picture of uh, the cache uh, electrical umbilical. It's going to stretch across the telescope internally to connect the electronic uh, module with uh, the NCC and some of the scientific instruments. Now, the ESM is mounted in the back of the payload bay here. And you can see Jim down deep uh, opening up the cover 
carefully taking it out. There's not a lot of clearance back there, and it's delicate, so we want to be very careful when we when we extract it that we didn't bump it or, or touch anything. You can also see as he raises it here that that's the radiator that's about to go on the side of Hubble. So uh, uh, it's a lot of a lot of keep out zones. He handed it up to Mike on the arm, and you can see Mike flying back. Nancy's uh, bringing Mike back around to the installation point uh, on the front of the telescope as it's rotated. Jim, uh, meanwhile, is working his way back to assist. They've got the ESM in, uh, and they're beginning to uh, uh, put on the connectors now. And it's not uh, wasn't so easy. We did a lot of connectors, John and I, but uh, Jim and Mike also had some uh, good tasks there for connectors uh, do, doing it uh, that day. Good shot of uh, Jim coming across the bay. Excuse me, Mike, and Jim's giving the thumbs up. Another picture here of Jim, which is kind of neat. He's on his back, and he's waving goodbye to the scope uh, end of the EVA. You can see the arm and the earth in the background, and that's through his helmet cameras. Kind of neat, uh, really good capability there. Uh, shot of uh, inside the telescope now. Uh, the uh, scientific instruments are there. They look like a couple of big black refrigerators. Uh, that's John and I now. Uh, we're going to get the NCC, which is part of the, uh, the cooling system that was, uh, uh, we installed to hopefully uh, bring back uh, the NICMOS. Uh, it's a good picture uh, there, and uh, John's got the uh, radio that you saw. He's bringing it back around. Nancy will fly him around to the installation point on the other side of the telescope and bay. You can see John at the top, and I'm down low here, kind of helping John guide it in and, and uh, assisting in alignment. When John gets uh, into position, he deploys the two locks or, or latches on the top of the uh, radiator, and I'll do the bottom. And then once that's in, we've strung a big conduit. You can see me reach up from the bottom there. I put this conduit in, and inside it, uh, there are electrical and uh, coolant lines that will connect to the NCC, which will then connect into the NICMOS. So once we have all that strung, uh, we have all the connections done, and uh, call it a day. It's time to close the doors. John's still in the arm, and I'll be down low assisting with the doors as they come closed. Uh, uh, the doors seem to be like an easy task, but uh, we were a little bit worried because there's a bit of warp in them, and we were, we were hoping they went well. They did. Uh, we stole our equipment and said goodbye for the day. Previously, I was the uh, robotics branch chief, and Mike actually worked for me uh, in that branch. And so I had promised him that uh, once he wasn't a rookie anymore, I'd let him actually fly the telescope on the end of the arm. They put this video in here because they thought I looked a little intense as I was looking over his shoulder uh, as he went in to grapple it. Keep in mind, it was fixed down the bay, so we knew he could handle this. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> he maneuvered the Hubble up, uh, up to a low hover position out of the bay, and then I took over for the release. And uh, for the release, we back away first with the arm. When the arm is clear of the telescope, uh, we then fired some jets on the orbiter to separate. And uh, Hubble comes right over our head here, uh, just a few feet over the cockpit. I've seen a tracking and data relay satellite come over my head, and I've seen Hubble come over my head. They're both very impressive when you see a 35,000 pound satellite coming over your head. And uh, the part of the mission we really didn't train for is I looked over at Scooter and we were plastered to the floor and the aft panel shortly after doing our job as we were overcome with cameras and handheld lasers. And I looked over at Scooter and I said, hey, I don't ever remember any simulator when we ended up laying on the floor after we deployed. <laughs> So they let us occasionally uh, peek our head up. You see Rick here with the handheld laser. And I really tried to keep the satellite in the view of the cameras as we separated. And it was just spectacular to look back and to see the Earth in the background and to know that we had left Hubble in a much better position than we did when we grappled it and with much greater capability. Hey, after all that hard work, we were really looking forward to a day off and getting cleaned up a little bit. And, and uh, those are the little personal kits we fly, and you got to make sure everything is strapped down or you're going to lose it. Uh, there's our exercise bike machine. We moved this guy twice a day because uh, we were so crowded in the orbiter. We had to move it around. It uh, felt great to get exercise up there. Uh, it, to me, it was the biggest surprise of the flight. Of, was how good it felt. Uh, meal time on the mid deck when we did get a chance to eat all together, you can see it was pretty crowded, but uh, thank goodness we all got along. Now, Mike did such a good job, he got his reward that day. <laughs> uh, even 360 miles up, the earth is zinging by pretty fast. Uh, this is a shot of looking straight down at the earth over the, the western coast of South America into the, the Andes. Uh, Scooter's taking some earth observation shots. Uh, Scientists like it when we bring back all kinds of data. This is not a, a camera trick. That's how curved the Earth looks when you're that high. 
Um, beautiful sunrises and sunsets. This is a sunrise. We got to see one of those about every hour, hour and a half. It was time to do the burn and uh, start thinking about going back home. You can see Na we didn't have our seats up, so Nancy didn't have her seat belt. She had to hang on for dear life there as the engines fired up. Uh, the next day, we got into our suits and, and uh, performed the big deorbit burn, and it was time to come home. Uh, Rick took this footage of the vertical tail glowing white hot as we entered the atmosphere. Of course, we had to scrub off all that, all that energy. He kept asking us to look in the back and, and, and see how hot it was back there, and none of us dared look. <laughs> has some things you don't want to see. And then Scooter took over manually and brought us in to land. Uh, it was just a beautiful night at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, as we looked out to see that, it was just a tremendous feeling. This is an IR shot. You can see us in the dive there. The thing, uh, shuttle does fly more like a brick in this phase, coming down pretty, uh, pretty quickly with a 20-degree dive. Back to the IR, you can see uh, the belly's pretty hot, but when the landing gear comes down, it's nice to see that they're uh, nice and cool there. This is the view I had looking out at the runway as we finally uh, came in right at the end, making the final flare as we come over the threshold. The idea is to touch down right about where those uh, lights begin. And we were so, uh, so thrilled with the landing here. We're going to see uh, in a moment that uh, landing gear heat up right away after uh, the friction of the runway is we're continuing to scrub off all that speed. And it was such a great landing. I love to see it two or three times. So we've thrown it in here. <laughs> it's just uh, amazing to me to, to think, though, that an hour before we were going around the Earth at uh, five miles every minute, every second, I'm sorry, and now uh, we're coming to a, a halt at the end of the runway here. Uh, our mission's coming to an end. Uh, our convoy comes out to get us. We get out of our suits, have a chance to come down and meet the administrator at the base of the, the crew transport vehicle there and say hello to folks and take a look at the vehicle that took us into orbit and brought us back safely. It, just a, a great chance, our first chance, too, to say thank you to all the folks and give them, I think, uh, our first salute for just a great job well done and taking care of us so well. Now, now the video uh, did a great job of capturing uh, most of the mission, but there's some things that uh, 